Good evening and welcome to Perigo. I'm Lindsay Perigo and I'm dangerous. Perigo is Portuguese for danger and that's what I want to be to the enemies of reason, freedom and excellence in all their various guises. There's a movie causing a bit of a stir in America right now. It's about what happens when the personifications of reason, freedom and excellence go on strike. Fed up with being persecuted and despised while carrying the world on their shoulders, they disappear to a secret safe haven where those who spit upon them while living off the wealth they create cannot touch them. The movie is, of course, Atlas Shrugged, the first of a three-part adaptation of Ayn Rand's novel of that name. Midas Mulligan. Who's asking? Someone who knows what it's like to work for himself and not let others feed off the profits of his energy. Who are you? We found a note. What did it say? It said, who is John Galt? One of the worst railroad accidents in recent history. A Taggart transcontinental freight train has crashed and derailed. I have to get the Rio Norte completely re-railed in nine months, and I'm gambling your new metal can do what you say it can. I'm staking my business on it. Nobody's used rear to metal. Why do we have to be the first? Well, they say you're intractable, you're ruthless, your only goal is to make money. My only goal is to make money. Yeah, but you shouldn't say it. If we're gonna bring Reardon down, we should do it from the inside. I am placing a moratorium on all railroad bonds. We can't afford to allow the expansion of a company which produces too much. A federal tax will be applied to all steel mills. They are not getting my metal. We'll find a way to fix this. You and your brother try to undermine me or go to the government. Maybe way. you should let me explain. Maybe you should let me finish speaking. It's a battle. What battle? I don't fight the bizarre. Or well, they have a weapon against you. What is wrong with the world? Well, I ask useless questions. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? Who is John Galt? In order to save my family's business, I'm gonna have to abandon it. I'm gonna take a leave and start my own company. And what are you gonna call this new line of yours? The John Galt line. We're not gonna allow you to run that train. You can do whatever you want with your men, Mr. Brady, but that train will run if I have to drive the damn thing myself. What we're doing, my metal, your railway, it's us who move the world. If you double-cross me, I will destroy you. When the novel came out 54 years ago, it was attacked by all and sundry. Conservatives attacked it because it attacked religion. Liberals attacked it because it attacked socialism. Intellectuals attacked it because it showed them up as charlatans and shysters, no better than witch doctors, and with even less excuse. Moralists of all stripes hated it because it taught that man is not a sacrificial animal and that the purpose of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, but to enjoy yourself and live. Ayn Rand herself acknowledged that she was challenging the cultural tradition of 2,500 years. The extraordinary thing was that for all the unremitting hatred poured upon it by all branches of the establishment, the novel became a runaway bestseller, cited in one famous survey as being the second most influential book after the Bible. Now mark this, ladies and gentlemen, when it becomes the most influential book and nonsense like the Bible and the Koran, not forgetting Mein Kampf and the Communist Manifesto, is widely derided as the life-hating, freedom-denying, mindless, superstitious derangement that it is, then the world will become free, prosperous, and peaceful, enduringly. Now, with what used to be able to call itself the free world disintegrating, exactly as Rand portrayed, with an open socialist in the White House whose economic SARS and their relentless regulations are straight out of the novel, the movie version is evoking a similar response. 
the critics are falling over themselves to deliver the smart arsiest one-line put-down. Atlas Shrugged is nearly as stilted, didactic and simplistic as Rand's free market fable, says the Washington Post. This comically tasteless and flavourless adaptation of Ayn Rand's bombastic magnum opus delivers her simplistic nostrums with smug self-satisfaction, says the New Yorker. Ayn Rand's monumental 1168-page 1957 novel gets the low-budget, no-talent treatment and sits there flapping on screen like a bludgeoned seal, says Rolling Stone. Now, I haven't seen the movie, but one thing I learned a long time ago, when the critics unanimously hate a movie, it's almost certain to be very, very good. The New York Post does allow this. This low-budget adaptation of Ayn Rand's novel nevertheless contains a fire and a fury that makes it more compelling than the average mass-produced studio item. On my own website, solopassion.com, philosophy professor Fred Seddon writes, just saw the movie for the third time. When I asked the ticket taker what was the most popular movie this weekend, he told me Atlas Shrugged. His theatre sold out at least one of the Saturday evening showings. The theatre I went to on Friday sold out two shows on Friday night. There was a round of applause at the end of the show today. Go Atlas. Well, Atlas is going. The novel is back in Amazon's overall top 20. It's enjoyed an astonishing comeback since the disastrous election of Obama Gabi, in fact. And the film is striking a timely blow against all the evil bastards like him, who want big government in your face, your pocket, your bedroom, your boardroom. Ladies and gentlemen, it may be too late, but if there is to be hope, this is it. That's the peritorial. Next, a clip from the movie, and you'll get to meet Ayn Rand herself. One of the ways in which Atlas Shrugged challenges convention is its attack on what is called the body-mind or matter-spirit dichotomy. You know how Christianity talks about the flesh lusting against the spirit and vice versa. Well, according to Ayn Rand, there's no such conflict, or at least no such necessary conflict. By material means, we express our spiritual values. Now, here's a scene from the movie in which this theme is played out. Industrialist, steelmaker, Hank Reardon, aglow with his latest metallurgical breakthrough, comes home to his fluff-head, social-climbing wife and mother and mooching brother, all of whom he eventually belatedly repudiates, but not before enduring this sort of thing. Hello, Henry. Hey, Paul. I know. I'm late. Could have called. Henry, do you mind holding the 10th of December open for me? That's three months away. I don't know what I'm doing next week. We started a major new pour today. Oh, it's our wedding anniversary, Henry. December 10th. Henry isn't interested in anything that doesn't tie in to his work. I know that you are very busy, but I would very much like for you to be there. Of course, Lillian, I'll be there. Thank you, dear. I want it to be special. Everyone will be there. Have you had any dinner, Henry? No, I was busy working. But I'm not hungry anymore. That's the trouble with you. You work too hard. Hmm. Ooh, what is this? I had it made from the first pour of Reardon metal. 
You're giving me a railroad spark? It's wonderful. It is. It's, it's, it's original. I'll be the toast of the town, wearing a piece of the same metal used to build railroads and bridges and, and sewer pipes and oil tanks and... You are so selfish, Henry. No, Philip, it is not the gift, it's the intention. The intention is pure selfishness, it seems to me. I mean, another man would have given his wife a diamond bracelet if he wanted to give her a gift for her pleasure, not his. No, a uh, chain is appropriate. I think it's the chain by which he holds us all in bondage. Henry's poured his medal today, and I have the first trophy. It's sweet. It's pathetic, Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Henry? Philip? What are you doing with yourself these days? I'm working for Friends of Global Awareness. I know them. What do you want? Money. Isn't everyone? Call my office first thing in the morning. I'll authorize a hundred grand for you. You really don't care about helping the underprivileged, do you? No, Philip, I don't. But it'll make you happy. Well, it's not for me, Hank. It's for the benefit of the less privileged. Do you think I can have the money wired to my account? A wire? Why? Well, the thing is, it's a progressive group. They wouldn't appreciate your name on a check. You're kidding me. It would embarrass us to have you on a list of our contributors. Now, such was the firestorm stirred up by Atlas the novel in the 1950s that television's then doyen of the interview, Mike Wallace, invited Ayn Rand to appear on his late-night television interview show. To this day, he remembers her dark, flashing eyes and her luminous intelligence. Even though he didn't agree with her philosophy, he and she became firm friends and regular dinner companions. The interview itself generated more mail and overall reaction than any interview prior to it. Here now are Ayn Rand and Mike Wallace. And now to our story. Down through history, various political and philosophical movements have sprung up, but most of them have died. Some, however, like democracy or communism, take hold and affect the entire world. Here in the United States, perhaps the most challenging and unusual new philosophy has been forged by a novelist, Ayn Rand. Ms. Rand's point of view is still comparatively unknown in America, but if it ever did take hold, it would revolutionize our lives. And Ayn, to begin with, I wonder if I can ask you to capsulize, I know this is difficult, can I ask you to capsulize your philosophy? What uh, is Randism? Uh, first of all, I do not call it Randism, and I don't like that name. All I right. call it objectivism, All right. meaning a philosophy based on objective reality. Now let me explain it as briefly as I can. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute, that man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it, and that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely a morality not based on faith. On faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic, which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. All right. All right. Now, may I define what my morality is? All right. Because this is merely an introduction. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action, and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind. 
that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness and that he must not force other people nor accept their right to force him that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest may uh, i interrupt now you may because you bring you you put this philosophy to work in your novel atlas shrugged that's right you demonstrate it in in human terms in your novel atlas shrugged and let me start by quoting from a review of this novel atlas shrug that appeared in newsweek it said that you are out to destroy almost every edifice in the contemporary american way of life our judeo-christian religion our modified government regulated capitalism are ruled by the majority will other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of god are these accurate criticisms uh yes i agree with the facts but not the estimate of this criticism namely if i am challenging the base of all these institutions i'm challenging the moral code of altruism the precept that man's moral duty is to live for others that man must sacrifice himself to others which is the present day morality what do you since mean by I sacrifice himself for others this now we're moment. getting to the point one moment since i'm challenging the base i necessarily would challenge the institutions you name which are a result of that morality all right and now what is self-sacrifice yes what is self-sacrifice you say that you do not like the altruism by which we live you you like a certain kind of ayn randist selfishness i uh, would say that i don't like is too weak a word i consider it evil and uh self-sacrifice is the precept that man needs to serve others in order to justify his existence that his moral duty is to serve others that is what most people believe today well yes we're taught to feel concerned for our fellow man to feel responsible for his welfare to feel that we are as religious people uh, might put it children under god and responsible one for the other now why do you rebel what's wrong with this philosophy but that is what uh, in fact makes man a sacrificial animal that man must work for others concern himself with others or be responsible for them that is the role of a sacrificial object i say that man is entitled to his own happiness and that he must achieve it himself but that he cannot demand that others give up their lives to make him happy I and read. nor should he wish to sacrifice himself for the happiness of others i hold that man should have self-esteem let's move ahead how, how how does your philosophy translate itself into the world of politics now one of the principal achievements of this country in the past 20 years particularly i think most people agree is the gradual growth of social protective legislation based on the principle that we are our brother's keepers how do you feel about the political trends of the united states the uh, western world the way everybody feels except more consciously i feel that it is terrible that you see destruction all around you and that you are moving toward disaster until and unless all those welfare state conceptions have been reversed and rejected it is precisely these trends which are bringing the world to disaster because we are now moving towards complete collectivism or socialism uh, a system under which everybody is enslaved to everybody and we are moving that way only because of our altruist morality ah, yes but you say everybody is enslaved to everybody yet this came about democratically i and the free people in a free country voted for this kind of government wanted this kind of legislation do you object to the democratic process i object to the idea that people have the right to vote on everything the uh, traditional american system was a system based on the idea that majority will prevailed only in public or political affairs and that it was limited by inalienable individual rights oh. therefore i do not believe that a majority can vote a man's life or property or freedom away from him therefore i do not believe that if a majority votes on any issue that this makes the issue right it doesn't all right then how do we arrive at action how should we arrive at action by voluntary consent voluntary cooperation of free men 
unforced. And how do our leaders arrive, how do we arrive at our leadership? Who elects, who appoints? Uh, the whole people elects. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the democratic process in politics. Uh, we arrive at it the way we arrived by the American Constitution as it used to be. By the constitutional process as we had it, uh, people elect officials, but the powers of those officials, the powers of government are strictly limited. They will have no right to initiate force or compulsion against any citizen except a criminal. Uh, those who have initiated force will be punished by force, and that is the only proper function of government. What we would not permit is the government to initiate force against people who have hurt no one, who have not forced anyone. We would not give the government or the majority or any minority the right to take the life or the property of others. That was the original American system. When you say it, take the property of others, I imagine that you're talking now about taxes. Yes, I am. And you believe that there should be no right by the government to tax. You believe that there should be no such thing as welfare legislation, unemployment compensation, regulation during times of stress, certain kinds of rent controls and things like that. That's right. I'm opposed to all forms of control. I am for an absolute, let's say fair, free, unregulated economy. Let me put it briefly. I'm for the separation of state and economics. Just as we had separation of state and church, which led to peaceful coexistence among different religions after a period of religious wars, so the same applies to economics. If you separate the government from economics, if you do not regulate production and trade, you will have peaceful cooperation and harmony and justice among men. How do we build roads, sanitation facilities, hospitals, schools? If you are not, if the government is not permitted to force, if you will, by vote, taxation, um, use your word, we have to depend upon uh, the trickle-down theory, upon the noblesse oblige, the largesse. I will, ask, uh, I will answer you by uh, asking you a question. Uh, who pays for all those things? We when, all of us pay uh, for these things. When you admit that you want to take money by force from someone and ask me how are we going to build hospitals or roads, you admit that someone is producing the money, the wealth, that will make those roads possible. Now you have no right to uh, tell the man who produced the wealth in what way you want him to spend it. If you need his money, you can obtain it only by his voluntary consent. And you believe in the eventual goodwill of all human beings, or at least that top echelon of human beings, whom you believe will give willingly? No goodwill is necessary, only self-interest. I believe in private roads, private post offices, private schools. When industry breaks down momentarily and there is unemployment, mass unemployment, we should not be permitted to get unemployment insurance. Social security we do not need. We'll depend upon the self-interest of these enlightened industrialists whom you so admire to take care of things when, when the economy needs a little lubrication and there are millions of people out of work. Study economics. A free economy will not break down. All depressions are caused by government interference. And the cure is always uh, offered so far to take more of the poisons that cause the disaster. Depressions are not a result of a free economy. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the lady about whom there is still so much controversy, 50 or so years after that interview. That was Ayn Rand, and my thanks to Mike Wallace for his interviewing expertise. Back with our closing music after this. Another way in which Atlas Shrugged hammers home the unity of mind and spirit is that among the, the men of the mind, the industrialists and entrepreneurs and scientists and so on, who go on strike is a musician, a composer, Richard Halley, who's written a concerto of deliverance to celebrate the grandeur of man at his best. 
Rand's description of it was probably inspired by two of her favourite actual works, the Rachmaninoff second and third piano concertos. It was a symphony of triumph. The notes flowed up. They spoke of rising and they were the rising itself. They were the essence and form of upward motion. They seemed to embody every human act and thought that had ascent as its motive. It was a sunburst of sound, breaking out of hiding and spreading open. It had the freedom of release and the tension of purpose. It swept space clean and left nothing but the joy of an unobstructed effort. Only a faint echo within the sounds spoke of that from which the music had escaped, but spoke in laughing astonishment at the discovery that there was no ugliness or pain, and there never had had to be. It was the song of an immense deliverance. And so, by way of homage to the novel and its author, we end tonight's Atlas Shrug special with the conclusion to Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, played by Georgi Cherkin, with the classic FM radio orchestra conducted by Georgi Dimitrov. Till next time, for reason, freedom and excellence, I'm Lindsay Perigo. Good night and good premises. Thank you.